<laughs> so today I want to talk about actions that I or you or the government do for the good of others but which are unwelcome uh, by those others. Um, in other words, I want to talk about paternalism. Um, in a typical case of paternalism, uh, the paternalist acts so as to benefit the paternalized subject, yes, um, but in a way that is not welcome by the paternalized subject. So I, I don't offer this as a definition of paternalism. I think it fails on that front for various reasons that I'm not going to get into. But I'm going to use this as the characterization of paternalism today because it'll be fine for my purposes. Um, I think what I have to say will work with basically any plausible definition of or conception of paternalism. Um, so but this is what we're going to work with. So in a typical case of paternalism, the paternalist and the paternalized subject disagree. Uh, so I was walking up here today, I was walking with Russ, and I said I'm going to use a PowerPoint. I don't usually use PowerPoint. We had a discussion about whether it was worth having PowerPoint. Um, and uh, suppose he had said, you know, I think it's a big mistake having a PowerPoint presentation. It's bad for you, uh, let alone the people in the audience. And he'd taken my, you know, USB stick and thrown it on the ground and crushed it under his heel. Um, we're disagreeing. Uh, this is an example of paternalism, paternalism, and it embodies two kinds of disagreements. So, um, one kind of disagreement is a decision about what should be done, what decision should be made, should there be a PowerPoint presentation or not. Uh, I'm going to call this a what disagreement, they're uh, manifest in typical instances of paternalism. Um, another kind of disagreement is about who should be making the decision in the first place. So um, suppose um, he convinced me or you know, said you know, PowerPoint, not the way to go, and I'm thinking, yeah, PowerPoint, not the way to go. But in the meantime, he's grabbed the stick and thrown it on the ground and crushed it, um, I might respond and say, well, look, I have a problem with the fact that it was you that made the decision. Um, so we're having a who disagreement, a disagreement about who should be making a particular decision. Um, one question worth thinking about is whether one or both of these disagreements, kinds of disagreement, are always present in cases of paternalism. Um, I don't think they are. I think there can actually be entirely disagreement-free paternalism. Um, but whenever paternalism does involve disagreement, um, I think there's actually always another kind of disagreement present, and it's a disagreement about the appropriateness of the paternalist's motive. Um, that is a disagreement over why the paternalist is acting as she does. So I'll call this a why disagreement. Um, and I actually think that this kind of disagreement is more important for understanding the nature of paternalism um, than either disagreements about who should be doing something or what should be done. Okay, so having made the, uh, these suggestive remarks, I'm actually going to leave behind questions about the nature or definition of paternalism and its connection to disagreements. Um, what I want to focus on are what disagreements. I want to focus on instances of paternalism where there is a disagreement about what should be done. Um, and I've got two questions. So, are there different kinds of what disagreements embedded in many instances of paternalism? And if yes to one, are the different kinds of what disagreements morally significant? Now, the standard view of paternalism answers these questions with a yes and a yes. Uh, they distinguish between weak and strong paternalism, and the claim is that weak paternalism is all else equal, uh, less morally problematic than strong paternalism. Um, weak and strong paternalism are differentiated from each other by the <coughs> nature of what the paternalist and the paternalized subject disagree about. That is purposely vague for reasons that will become clear in a minute. So that's the standard answer. My answer is also yes and yes. So, so far, so conventional. Um, but my goal is to show that the standard ways of understanding the weak and strong distinction are unsustainable. Um, that's why I haven't yet offered a gloss on what exactly the distinction is. Um, I think there is an important distinction of this kind to make, but I just don't think the standard views about what it is get it right. And so that my paper is devoted to showing why and proposing a more fruitful way of making the distinction or something in the neighborhood. Um, indeed, one of the things I'm trying to figure out is whether the distinction really does survive my way of thinking about it. Um, and part of the issue is that I actually think there's more than one distinction. So it might be more accurate to say um, that I reject the standard view according to which there's weak and strong paternalism, where the former is less morally objectionable than the latter. Um, rather, I think the distinction in how it is typically construed is pointing at something or some things normatively significant, um, and so shouldn't be rejected out of hand. Shouldn't be rejected out of hand, even if at the end of the day, thinking in terms of weak and strong is perhaps not as illuminating um, as it could be. Um, so why care about this? Um, well, just remember what's motivating all this. We're wondering about actions that I do for your good, but where you and I disagree about what is good for you. Um, these actions almost always have a moral taint. They make us uncomfortable. Um, but how uncomfortable they make us and why is not entirely <coughs> clear. And I think the standard account uh, that provides at least part of the answer, or tries to provide at least part of the answer for the how and the why, miss the mark. And so my goal is to find the mark. Okay, 
Let's start with, um, we've already had Ronald Dworkin uh, invoked, let me uh, invoke the other great Dworkin of contemporary philosophy, Gerald Dworkin, um, who distinguishes between weak and strong paternalism uh, in the Stanford Encyclopedia uh, on philosophy. I actually have a hand on this, sorry, I meant the hand. So, this just has not, I didn't put the quotations up there, because they're lengthy in the line. So, apologies. This is an outline of the presentation. So we're already on number two. So, I will, I will read slowly. You can catch up as the handout comes back. So here's what he says. A weak paternalist believes that it is legitimate to interfere with the means that agents choose to achieve their ends, if those means are likely to defeat those ends. So if a person really prefers safety to convenience, then it is legitimate to force them to wear seatbelts. A strong paternalist believes that people may have mistaken, confused, or irrational ends, and it is legitimate to interfere to prevent them from achieving those ends. If a person really prefers the wind rustling through their hair to increase safety, it is legitimate to make them wear helmets while motorcycling because their ends are irrational or mistaken. Another way of putting this, we may interfere with mistakes about the facts, but not mistakes about the values. About values. So if a person tries to jump out of a window believing he will float gently to the ground, we may restrain him. If he jumps because he believes that it's important to be spontaneous, we may not. All right, so Dworkin says a bunch of stuff here that is worth separating out. Um, he doesn't put things in terms of strong and weak paternalism, but rather in terms of strong and weak paternalists, who he understands as advocating for views about which kinds of paternalism are justified or as he puts it legitimate. But this presupposes that there are different kinds of paternalism in the first place. So I think it's more productive to talk first about weak and strong paternalism, uh, and then later we can make claims about whether weak paternalism is less morally problematic than strong paternalism. Um, and indeed, this way of proceeding is implicit in what Dworkin says. So, weak paternalism is paternalism prompted by the other's choice of means, whereas strong paternalism is prompted by the other's choice of ends, in all cases, uh, for the sake of the paternalized subjects. Good. Um, in cases of weak paternalism, X and Y disagree about which means are most effective to some welfare-related end of Y's. In cases of strong paternalism, X and Y disagree about whether Y's commitment to some end is good for Y. I'm going to call this the means end version of the weak strong distinction. But Dworkin also tells us that weak paternalism is directed at the other's presumptively mistaken beliefs about facts. And the example is if I jump out the window, I will certainly be able to fly. Whereas strong paternalism is directed at the other's presumptively mistaken values. Spontaneity, as exhibited by my decision to jump out the window, is extremely important. I'm going to call this the fact value version of the weak strong distinction. So in cases of weak paternalism, um, X and Y disagree about the relevant facts. In cases of strong paternalism, X and Y disagree about the appropriateness of Y's prudential values. So we can ask whether either way of making the distinction, with an eye to identifying a class of paternalism that is less morally objectionable than some other class of paternalism, is sustainable. And I think the answer is no. We need to look elsewhere for an account of the distinction between weak and strong paternalism. So uh, before getting to my critique of the means end version of the strong weak distinction, uh, I want to note how it has been asked to do some heavy lifting in recent arguments in favor of paternalism. Uh, the most prominent example comes from Sarah Conley's uh, robust defense of coercive paternalism in her book Against uh, Autonomy, um, which uh, even though I take issue with it, it's really excellent, uh, I think, in any case. Um, so, Conley argues that uh, making people do things for their own good by removing options is oftentimes permissible. Um, for her, the issue of when coercive paternalism is justified is just a matter of figuring out whether the good of a particular coercive paternalistic intervention outweighs the bad. And she thinks it often does. Moreover, she thinks the purported bads of coercive paternalism, threats to individuality and authenticity, are just that, purported. In the very least, they're overblown. Um, she isn't remotely moved by the idea that people, quote, simply have the right to determine what happens to them, so long as that does no harm to others. So, I'm not interested in that at all. Um, there's a lot to take issue with in Conley's account, um, but what I want to focus on is a super important qualification she makes. Let's see. Oh yeah, right. Um, so on the face of it, she's advocating for a highly illiberal position, but I actually think appearances uh, are deceiving. And that's because she insists in a number of places that the kind of paternalism that she favors is not, as she puts it, about ultimate ends, but only about means. So here's a couple places where she says this. I'm arguing for intervention in cases where people's choices of instrumental means are confused in a way uh, that means they will not achieve their ultimate ends. Uh, and elsewhere, she says, there is a clear difference between a paternalism about ends and a paternalism about means. 
Uh, the claim, presumably, is not just that there's a difference in kinds of paternalism, but that this matters morally. The aim of paternalistic intervention for Conley is helping people achieve their own ends, whatever they might be. All right, so I think there are three problems. We're now in section three of the handout. Uh, three problems of understanding the weak strong distinction in terms of means versus ends. The first is what we call the means ends interdependence problem. So friends of the means versus ends view think that there is a morally significant difference between paternalistically targeting an agent's means and paternalistically targeting her ends. Uh, why do they think this? The usual explanation goes through the value of autonomy, which is understood as involving the ability to form and pursue one's own conception of the good, whether it be worthwhile or not. Um, you could look elsewhere for an explanation. So another way of going would be to explain uh, this difference in the supposed moral valence between targeting means versus ends uh, is explained by the nature of well-being. So if you help yourself to some, some subjective conception of well-being, uh, according to which roughly what is good for a person is entirely a function of what that person or some suitably idealized version of her wants, desires, and prefers. If you help yourself to that, then strong paternalistic interventions um, are not going to be justified. Um, it simply won't ever be good for someone to have the pursuit of her ends thwarted, since what is good for her is a function of those very ends. Now, the details would clearly need to be spelled out, and obviously not everyone accepts um, a theory of well-being like this, including me. Um, but we can move past this by noticing a shared assumption in both kinds of answers. And the assumption is this, uh, that people's ends are relatively fixed, and more precisely have a kind of rational and not merely psychological stability, even in the face of their adherents learning that they are pursuing the wrong means to their end. To put the point more simply, uh, the assumption is that a person's fealty to an end is not partly rationally conditioned by their understanding of the means <coughs> required to achieve it. Now, in some cases, I think that's true. Sometimes <laughs> someone knows that he's pursuing the wrong means to his end, um, but nonetheless wants the end, uh, such as the case of, with weakness of will. So the agent has a clear view of what is required to achieve his end, but fails to take it. But in many cases, there's no failure of will. There's a failure to really appreciate what the means to your ends are in the first place. There's a misalignment between what the agent believes the means to her ends are and what they actually are. And in, in these cases, the point of weak paternalism is to effectively fix the misalignment by making the agent take the actual means to his end. But of course, there's another way to fix the misalignment. Um, the person could abandon the end. And perhaps that is exactly what our agent would do if she understood the means required to achieve it. In other words, in some cases where there's a misalignment between chosen means or what we might call apparent means and achievement of the end, we should not treat the other's ends as fixed and attempt to align her means with it. Rather, the agent's lack of understanding about what is involved in achieving her end should make us wonder about her commitment to the end in the first place. So I think it's really easy to miss this point, um, at least when thinking about paternalism, because the kind of uh, interdependence between means and ends that I'm interested in is often absent in the kinds of examples that get discussed in the literature. Uh, they tend to be sort of much simpler, where someone's just making sort of a simple technical mistake about something that they really clearly value, like getting on the wrong bus or something like that. Um, so I want to give a really full-blooded example, one from real life that I think uh, beautifully makes the point. Um, I'm just going to warn you, it also very, very, very painfully makes the point. So it's a very, very sad story um, about a child dying. Um, but it, it, it struck me, uh, not just for philosophical reasons, but also for philosophical reasons. So I'm going to share a little bit of, of it with you today, uh, and I'll just warn you in advance. It's, it, it's difficult to listen to. Um, so years ago, the author Alexander Hamon wrote a really soul-shattering non-fiction story called um, The Aquarium about his young daughter's short life with a terminal brain tumor. It was in The New Yorker. I don't know if anyone read it. Uh, I highly recommend it, although you'll need some time afterwards to just sit there and do nothing. Um, she died a little past uh, one year of age, 108 days after her diagnosis. So um, it's, it's hard to read, but I want to share with you the description um, of how uh, their daughter died. So this is from the story. I'm just going to read it. So the phone rang in the middle of the night. Uh, Terry put Dr. Fangaruso on the line. And he told me that Isabel was having, quote, a really hard time maintaining her blood pressure. I needed to come to the hospital as soon as possible. After dropping Ella off with my sister-in-law, their other child, I sped to the hospital. I found a crowd of the ICU staff looking into Isabel's room, where she was surrounded by a pack of doctors and nurses. She was bloated, her eyelids swollen. 
Her little hands were stabbed with needles as liquid was pumped uh, into her to keep her blood pressure up. Dr. Fangusaro and Dr. Lula sat us down to tell us that Isabel's state was dire. Terry and I needed to tell them whether we wanted them to try everything they could to save her. We said yes. They made it clear that we would have to be the ones to tell them to stop, when to stop trying. And now my memory collapses. Terry is in the corner, weeping ceaselessly and quietly, the terror on her face literally unspeakable. The gray-haired attending doctor, whose name has vanished from my mind, though his face stares at me daily, is issuing orders as residents take turns compressing Isabel's chest because her heart has stopped beating. They bring her back as I wail, my baby, my baby, my baby. Then there's another decision that Terry and I have to make. Isabel's kidneys have stopped functioning. She needs dialysis, and an immediate surgical intervention is necessary to connect her to the dialysis machine. There's a good chance that she will not survive the surgery. We say yes to it. Her heart stops beating again. The residents are compressing her chest. In the hallway outside, people unknown to me are rooting for Isabel, some of them in tears. My baby, my baby, my baby, I keep howling. I hug Terry. Isabel's heart starts beating again. The gray-haired doctor turns to me and says 12 minutes, and I cannot comprehend what he's saying. But then I realize. What he is saying is that Isabel was clinically dead for 12 minutes. Then her heart stops beating again. A young resident is half-heartedly compressing her chest, waiting for us to tell her to stop. We tell her to stop. She stops. I warned you. Um, Terry and Alexander wanted the doctors to do everything. Uh, I'm loath to translate this heartbreaking story into the language of ends and means, but here I go. Uh, they had as their end something like, do whatever it takes to increase our daughter's chance of survival. But then this is how the next paragraph begins. In my hastily suppressed visions, I'd foreseen the moment of my child's death. But what I'd imagined, despite my best efforts, was a quiet, filmic moment in which Terry and I held Isabel's hands as she peacefully expired. I could not have begun to imagine the intensity of the pain <coughs> as the nurses removed all the tubes and wires and everyone cleared out and Terry and I held our dead child. Our beautiful, ever-smiling daughter, her body bloated with liquid and battered by compressions, kissing her cheeks and toes. Though I recall that moment with absolute crushing clarity, it is still unimaginable to me. So I don't pretend to speak for Alexander and Terry, and I suspect that uh, many parents would do nothing differently, even with full knowledge of the likely end. Uh, and and it, my understanding is that it really was the likely end. One thing that's striking about reading the story in The New Yorker is that that doesn't come up at all. So if you do any bioethics work, or if you've read Anatole Go One Day, um, the story has this sort of subcurrent, I don't know if it's intentionally there, of the failure of the medical team to sit them down and say, if you want to do everything, this is what everything's going to look like, at least as far as I can tell from the story, in any case. Um, but here we have a crushing account of how a person's commitment to an end can be misaligned with his conception of the means for that end in a way that might throw doubt on that person's commitment to the end in the first place. Certainly prior to reading the story, I would have told doctors to do everything had one of my children been in the situation. But now, knowing better what everything actually looks like, I'm not so sure. The point is that our fealty to ends is conditioned by our understanding of what it will take to achieve them. If our understanding of the latter changes, so too might our fealty to the end, and oftentimes rationally so. Whether it changes or not, and whether that change or stasis is rational is going to depend on just how important it is to us to achieve the end, as well as how radical the change is in our understanding of the means required to achieve it. So we can't always take people's ends as read and then focus on the question of how best to achieve them as though that were a distinct issue. So the upshot is that there's not the sharp moral distinction between paternalistically targeting ends and paternalistically targeting means and advocates of the means versus ends version of the weak strong distinction would have us believe that there is. There is. It might well be that in making someone do something they don't want to do for the sake of some end of theirs, we are not in fact helping them realize what they most want. Uh, what they most want may well change when they realize what would need to happen to realize their end. Okay, so that's the first problem. And it challenges the idea that a person's actual ends always have a kind of moral weight that their means do not. Um, and th this objection sort of a grants to the, to the weak, uh, sorry, the means versus ends view uh, that we can fairly easily distinguish a person's means from her ends. Uh, the next two problems challenge that assumption. So here's problem two. Um, what do we talk about when we talk about um, X being a means to Y? Well, I think we are, we can, we're talking about one of two kinds of relationships. Uh, the first is merely causal. So uh, X is a means to Y if X causes Y. Uh, the second is one of specification. 
X is a means to Y um, if it is a specification of Y. What's the difference? So I'm not going to try to give a general account. I want to illustrate by way of examples. So an example of the first is the relationship between my using a hammer in a certain way and a picture being secured to a wall. Hammering a nail into the wall is a means to hanging a picture. An example of the second uh, would be the relationship between running and getting exercise. Uh, running is a means to, or maybe more naturally in, in English, um, a means of getting exercise. Uh, the difference is that running is not something that precedes exercise. It is itself a way of exercising. And the same is not true of banging a nail into the wall. Um, it is not a way of a picture being secured to a wall. That comes next. So there's a temporal ordering to causal means ends relationships that is not present in specification means ends relationships. Okay, why does any of this cause a problem for the um, means ends version of the weak strong distinction? Well, it's pretty simple, it's just that it's not clear, either metaphysically or morally, how to understand paternalism directed at a person's specification means. Uh, so far as I know, no one who makes the distinction this way talks about that or acknowledges that we might mean one of two different things by talking about means in relations to ends. So let me give you an example. It's a self, this is a self-respect example. Um, suppose you and I agree that self-respect is important. We both think you shouldn't do things that are inconsistent with maintaining your self-respect. Now consider some act. For example, playing in a dad band. Um, the, what's a dad band? It's got negative connotations. It's a band made up um, exclusively of fathers. They tend to be about middle age. Uh, who are trying to you know, recapture the glory of their youth by playing rock music. Um, uh, if you think I've insulted you, I've also insulted myself. So it's, uh, um, okay, so I, I think that doing it is inconsistent with self-respect. You disagree. Now, we might disagree because we don't agree on the non-respect facts of the case, what the act will lead to, what it involves, and so on and so forth. We accept the same sort of conditionals, uh, conditionals like if playing in a dad band involves wildly convort, uh, cavorting on stage in tight pants, then it is inconsistent with self-respect. Um, but then we disagree about whether the antecedent of the conditional obtains. But we might still disagree if we agree on all the non-respect facts, and that's because we just might have different conceptions of what counts as self-respect in the first place. I think that playing in a dad band counts as a way of disrespecting oneself. You don't. We both value self-respect, but our specification of self-respect is different. So, I interfere with your efforts to put together a dad band. Now, is that weak paternalism? Um, if so, does that give it the same moral status as other more standard instances of weak paternalism, where I'm inter interfering with your causal means? Um, well, that doesn't seem right. Uh, what's at stake here is your very understanding of what self-respect involves, and not simply how to get something that we both see in common. So, maybe this is a form of strong paternalism. Well, that's fine, but if it is, we're going to need a subtler way of thinking about the weak-strong distinction, since thinking of it simply in terms of means versus ends won't do the trick. There's no doubt that in some standard sense of means, what I'm interfering with in the self-respect case is your perceived means of achieving or maintaining self-respect. So, the upshot is that the means-end version fails to distinguish between causal and specification means-ends relationships, and so results in no clear answer to cases like self-respect. So, problem number two. On to problem number three. The instability problem. Okay, to get at this problem, consider the disagreement embodied in the fabulous song by the cowboy junkies, Misguided Angel. This is my CanCon for the talk. Um, the protagonist's family thinks she's making a bad choice in choosing to run off with the man she's singing about. She, however, is firm in her choice. Moreover, she doesn't seem to be deceived in any simple way about the nature of the man she has chosen. She knows that he's seriously fold, uh, flawed. Here's what she says. Um, I said, Mama, he's crazy and he scares me, but I want him by my side. Though he's wild and he's bad and sometimes just plain mad, I need him to keep me satisfied. So we've got Mama in the picture, but let's give names to our protagonist and her man just to keep things straight. So we'll call them Eleanor and Micah. Now, suppose that out of concern for Eleanor, Mama contrives to separate her from Micah by offering Micah a substantial sum of money to get on a bus tonight and to never come back. Is this uh, weak paternalism? Or, you know, and we know the character of Micah, so he may very, may very well do it if it's enough money. Um, is this weak paternalism or strong paternalism? Well, we might see it as strong paternalism, and I think this is how fans of the distinction would see it. Eleanor's end is to spend the rest of her days with Micah. Mama aims to thwart the realization of that end, so she arranges the world such that Eleanor cannot achieve it. Strong paternalism. But now suppose we ask Eleanor, why do you want to spend the rest of your days with him? She gives us an answer to keep me satisfied. 
To move away from the lyrics, we might imagine that what Eleanor wants is a meaningful relationship that will emotionally, intellectually, and physically sustain her over the course of her life. Uh, and if I had thought of it before this very moment, I should have written a fictional verse that captured that, but in any case. Um, let's assume she's wrong to think that Micah will give that to her. Staying with Micah now looks like a really poor means for achieving her end. This relationship is not the one that's going to get her what she really wants. So Mama actually aims to thwart the means by which Eleanor aims to achieve her end. Ah, so we're dealing with an instance of weak paternalism. The general problem is that for more or less any instance of purported strong paternalism, we can recontextualize the disagreement as part of a larger agreement, and in doing so, recategorize paternalism as an instance of weak paternalism. And if weak paternalism is generally less morally problematic than strong paternalism, voila, we have a nice way of turning more morally problematic instances of paternalism into less morally problematic instances of paternalism. Um, indeed, fans of the means versus ends version of the weak strong distinction take advantage of precisely this move to make the weak strong distinction in the first place. A local disagreement about whether S should X is couched in terms of a larger agreement that Y is what S is after. What proponents of the distinction don't see is that this move generates instability. There's almost never going to be a resting place of absolute disagreement from where we can then judge whether the proposed paternalistic intervention is targeted at means or ends. Okay, so, so much for the means versus ends version of the distinction. <coughs> um, how about Dworkin's <coughs> other suggestion? Um, weak paternalism stems from disagreements about facts, whereas strong paternalism stems from disagreement about values. How does the facts versus values version of the weak strong distinction fare? Well, I don't think very well. Uh, I'm going to give a counterexample to it, I think. Indeed, I am. Um, Marvin and the blood transfusion. So Marvin is a Jehovah's Witness. Um, unfortunately, he needs a life-saving blood transfusion. He refuses because, quote, God views blood as representing life, and so he avoids taking, uh, and so, quote, he avoids taking blood not only in obedience to God, but also out of respect for him as the giver of life. Uh, this is from a, uh, a Jehovah's Witness um, FAQ that you can find on the internet. Um, to defy God's commands in this respect is to risk one's eternal salvation. So here's our question. Oh, there's the case, excuse me. So, suppose we give Marvin the transfusion for his own good. Is our paternalism weak or strong? Well, according to the fact-value version of the distinction, it's weak paternalism. Um, our target is not Marvin's belief that eternal salvation is more valuable than a longer earthly life. Our target is his belief that a life of eternal salvation is foreclosed to people that get blood transfusions. Now, we might disagree with this because we're atheists or because we're theists of a different stripe than Marvin. Um, it doesn't matter. The point is that our disagreement is about the facts. The patient believes that he can achieve something he values, or at least leave open the chance of achieving it by refusing a blood transfusion. This leads him to instrumentally disvalue blood transfusions. We think he's wrong about the relationship between blood transfusions and eternal salvation, and that makes our paternalism weak. Uh, does this show there's a problem for understanding the weak strong distinction in terms of facts versus values? Um, well, if it does, it's not because the weak paternalist is going to have to say that we'd be justified in acting paternalistically here. So the weak paternalist doesn't claim that all instances of weak paternalism are justified. Uh, the claim is just that they're less morally problematic than strong paternalism. And that's perfectly consistent with the idea that some cases of weak paternalism are unjustified. And so you might point to other features of the case for why we shouldn't be paternalistic here. Um, maybe we have serious worries about whether the paternalistic intervention would actually be successful. <coughs> I mean, maybe we would cause so much psychic distress to Marvin, um, who now thinks that eternal salvation is foreclosed to him, that we're in fact making him worse off. Maybe. Um, or perhaps we have policy worries in mind. Things won't go well from a public health standpoint um, if competent adults can't trust that their religious convictions will be respected when they go to the hospital, even if in this particular case we're going to make Marvin better off by acting paternalistically. But canvassing these explanations for why it's impermissible to act paternalistically with respect to Marvin points us to what I think is the real problem for understanding the weak strong distinction in terms of facts versus values. The distinction just doesn't seem to be doing any normative work in this case, or indeed in any case where the paternalism is a response to a deeply held but false belief about facts as opposed to values. Is that a problem? Well, I think it's definitely a retreat for fans of the distinction. Uh, who invoke it initially to cover precisely a case like Marvin's. Um, indeed, we might wonder whether the distinction has any normative relevance at all if it's going to put cases like Marvin's on the weak side. Okay, so this is my only fancy PowerPoint trick. Cool. That doesn't work. Amazing, right? Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, can we save the distinction? Um, well, one answer is no, and who cares? But uh, I think that's too hasty. Um, 
All the examples I've offered above are getting at something normatively important about different kinds of paternalism. So I think there is uh, gold to be mined here. Um, if not gold, maybe a less precious metal, but something valuable nonetheless. Um, I just think that previous efforts um, haven't actually found the seam, and as I indicated at the beginning of the talk, I actually think there, there are two seams. There's two relevant things to say here. Um, so to get at them, let's contrast Marvin's case with another. So suppose someone doesn't want to wear his seatbelt because he believes that driving with a seatbelt makes him less safe. Um, we know that he's wrong about this, and we somehow paternalistically interfere to make him wear a seatbelt. This is a paradigmatic case of weak paternalism. The question is how to account for its weakness um, or the feature that usually makes it identified with weakness, but which I'm going to identify with something else, um, while putting cases like Marvin's on the other side. Um, can we find a principal difference between the two? Um, as I just mentioned, I actually think there are two differences. <coughs> so the first has to do with the place of the contested belief in the paternalization of <coughs> perception. The second has to do with the nature of the contested beliefs. So let me say something about what I mean. So the first difference is the place of the mistaken uh, factual belief in the agent's self-understanding and how he chooses to live in the world on the basis of that understanding. So Marvin's sense of self, uh, of who he is, of what matters, is intimately bound up with a set of beliefs about how the world works, including the belief that there is a god that forbids blood transfusions. To challenge this belief is to take on a central part of Marvin's identity. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't challenge it. Uh, the idea is just that the disputed belief is intimately related to Marvin's sense of self. The same is not likely true of someone who believes that seatbelts don't save lives or make you less safe. Um, this belief likely plays no important part in their self-understanding, although we can definitely construct an example where it does. Um, so one question we can ask about the targeted belief of our paternalistic intervention is this. To what extent is the targeted belief bound up with the paternalized subject's self-understanding? Self-understanding here encompasses more than a person's belief about herself. Rather, it encompasses a person's beliefs about her place in the world, given her way of understanding that world. Um, so the belief that there is an afterlife uh, is plausibly a central part of a person's self-understanding, in as much as that belief plays a central part in a person's conception of how to navigate the world as the person he is. Um, far less uh, likely that uh, the belief that seatbelts don't keep you safe is central to a person's self-conception in this way. Um, so my idea is that the more bound up the target of belief is of the person's self-understanding, in the sense just articulated, the greater the presumption against the permissibility of paternalistic intervention. So that's consideration one. There's another one. Um, consider the following case. Joan, the anti-vaxxer. Um, Joan believes that vaccinations don't work. Moreover, she thinks they are linked to various illnesses as a result of the mercury they contain, and that the massive scientific support for vaccinations is part of a large conspiracy foisted on an unwitting population by the pharmaceutical industry. These beliefs about vaccinations in the pharmaceutical industry are of a piece with Joan's other conspiracy-minded beliefs. So as in Marvin's case, we have someone making a decision on the basis of false beliefs. Also like Marvin's case, the false belief here is plausibly an important part of Joan's self-understanding. Anyone who has had the misfortune of engaging with a conspiracy-minded individual, uh, as I have, knows that their self-understanding is, in my sense, really bound up with their wacky conception of how the world works. To really internalize that vaccines, for example, are safe and effective would seriously alter Joan's sense of self, of how she relates to and should relate to the world around her. But there's an important difference between the cases, between Marvin and Joan's case. I, I put it like this. Joan's belief is demonstrably false, whereas Marvin's is not. Um, what it means to say that a belief is demonstrably false is not something I'm going to get into. Um, I'll just say that not only the degree to which, but also the way in which a belief can be demonstrably false can vary. Some beliefs are empirically demonstrably false, others will be a priori demonstrably false, some will be in principle demonstrably false, but not actually demonstrably false. Um, maybe there are some that are not even in principle demonstrably false. Uh, I'll just add here as a qualification, my epistemolo epistemologist close friend um, thinks that the language of demonstrably false is misleading here, that, that, some, that, that very, very little is demonstrably false. So um, if you prefer hearing this in terms of um, um, sort of reasonable response to available evidence, um, that's, that's what I have in mind. Um, Okay, so with those vague remarks on what it means for something to be demonstrably false, I'm, I'm going to rely on you sharing the thought that we can show that Joan's belief is false in a way and to a degree that we cannot show that Marvin's belief is false. 
Um, of course, this doesn't mean that we'll be able to convince Joan that her belief is false. Indeed, there's evidence that trying to show someone like Joan that her belief is false will only make her more committed to it. Um, the point is just that there's an overwhelming preponderance of non-controversial evidence that her belief is false. So, another question we can ask about the targeted belief of our paternalistic intervention is this. To what extent is the target of belief demonstrably false? And my idea is that the less demonstrably false the target of belief, the greater the presumption <laughs> against the permissibility of paternalistic intervention. <clears throat> All right. So there are two dimensions then across which we should assess the target of beliefs of someone toward whom we want to act paternalistically. We should consider the belief's centrality to identity and its degree of demonstrability. The more central a belief is to a person's uh, identity and the less demonstrably false it is, the greater the presumption against paternalistically interfering with the agent who is going awry on the basis of that belief. Um, so we can capture the idea that there's a strong presumption against paternalistically interfering with Marvin, if you have that intuition as I do. Um, his religious convictions are central to his identity and not demonstrably false. Likewise, we can capture the idea that the presumption against paternalistically requiring someone who doesn't believe that seatbelts make one safer, making that person wear a seatbelt, is considerably weaker. The belief is both demonstrably false and not central to a person's identity. And then there are going to be the mixed cases like Jones, uh, and I'll just say it's somewhere in between. Uh, they're complicated cases, but they're, the, the presumption is less strong than in the Marvin case and stronger than in the Seatbelt case. Okay, um, at this point, uh, you might be wondering, you might be wondering any number of things. Here's one thing you might be wondering. Um, is my way of putting things susceptible to the same or closely allied problems that I identified for the means ends version of the weak strong distinction? And remember, there were three problems. Uh, I just want to focus on the last, on the instability problem. That was the, uh, well, I'll tell you what it is right now. I'm happy to talk about the other two, but for now, the last one. So, that problem, recall, is that the uh, nested nature of our ends allows standard cases of strong paternalism to be recast as instances of weak paternalism by recasting a disagreement about an end as a disagreement about the means to some further shared end. And so you might say, look, isn't something similar true with respect to the commitments that are important to a person's self-conception? So consider again our misguided angel case. Um, Eleanor's commitment to Michael is surely an important part of her self-conception. However, her interest in having a satisfying family life is also surely a part of her self-conception, and she mistakenly sees Micah as the way to get to that. But we know she's wrong about that. So we tell ourselves, when we prevent Eleanor from marrying Micah, we're actually helping her live in accordance with a deep commitment, and not simply, as it initially appeared, getting in the way of another one. Um, and so, once again, uh, what looked like an instance of the morally problematic kind of paternalism now looks like it's not so bad. Uh, we just recast the disagreement. Um, the instability remains. Um, I think there are two reasons why my view is in better shape than the means versus ends view with respect to this problem. So, first, um, uh, so where the question is, is, is it in fact a problem for my view? Two parts. No. Um, while it's true that disagreements over identity-involving beliefs can be recast in terms of larger agreements over other identity-involving beliefs, the extent to which we can make this move is more limited than the extent to which we can recast disagreements about ends as disagreements about means. In the latter case, in recasting disagreements about ends as disagreements about means, it looked like we could uh, recast disagreements until we got to final formal ends, like I want to flourish, be happy, be well off. Um, as a result, more or less all instances of strong paternalism can be recast as instances of weak paternalism. But I don't think the same is plausibly true on my view. Um, when we recast disagreements about identity involving beliefs in terms of higher level agreements, we will at some point start moving away from identity involving beliefs altogether, since the commitments will become increasingly formal. Everyone wants to be happy, let's just assume that that's true. But that universal commitment tells us almost nothing about what kind of person someone is. In order to know that, we need to know what they take happiness to be and, relatedly, how they think they can get it. Um, another way of putting this point is that what we might call the, the meaty commitments that determine a person's self-conception are constituted by that person's mid-level or mid-to-high-level ends and not their highest ends, since the latter are, on their own, nearly formal. So the instability that comes with the means versus ends view is far more extensive than the instability that comes with my view. But look, there's still going to be some instability on my view. There's going to be cases, and maybe the misguided angel case is one, where it's none too clear how to think about the relationship between two identity-involving commitments that are at play, and as a result, the degree to which the paternalism that we're contemplating is problematic. 
But whereas I presented this kind of indeterminacy as a bug of the means versus ends way of looking at things, I actually think it's a feature of my view. Um, so why? why? Why can I do that? Um, well, simply because the difficult cases, uh, the cases where paternalism would seem to both interfere with but also promote a person's identity involving commitments, commitments that are a part of um, uh, the person's identity to varying degrees, and maybe they stand in some kind of relationship to each other, maybe is cause to effect or determinant to determinable, well, those are really difficult cases. And it seems exactly right to me that we shouldn't be able to label these cases as either instances of weak or strong paternalism. So the instability in the hard cases, I think, is fine. Um, but look, if, if that's not a problem for my view, why is it a problem for the means versus ends view? that it suffers from this indeterminacy. Um, well, the answer, I think, is that the means versus ends version of the distinction, and I think this is true of the fact versus value version too, invites us to think of paternalism as coming in distinct kinds, when in fact um, it doesn't. Um, how much time do I have? Three minutes? OK, that's great. I'll, I'll, I, I won't continue on that point. Uh, briefly, I, I, the way I put it is my way of seeing things as analog, the way that they make the distinctions digital, but that's OK, that's all I'll say. Um, so um, it's going to be true that on both my way of seeing things and the standard way, there are going to be cases that are very hard to neatly classify. But unlike with the standard view, my view doesn't purport to carve things up. <coughs> and so it's not a problem when it doesn't. All right, just about finished. So I've identified two axes of assessment when thinking about the disagreements contained in many instances of paternalism. Centrality to identity and degree of demonstrability. Um, here's a big question. Um, why care about these two axes in the first place? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm just going to say something briefly about this. In fact, what, what I have to say has been said uh, um, already today in various ways. Um, the relevance of the centrality to identity factor has to do with the value of authenticity, uh, by which I mean the value of people living their lives in accordance with their own conception of what is worthwhile. Um, the relevance of the degree of demonstrability factor has to do with the importance of appealing to a common stock or shared, or in some admittedly vague sense, shareable um, set of reasons when contemplating actions that bear on how others should live. This is particularly important thinking about governmental or institutional paternalism, I think. Um, but I actually think it's true in interpersonal cases um, as well. Um, so it, it's important to remember that we're interested in cases where I act for your good but where my action is unwelcome because you and I disagree about what's good for you. The idea is that how much this should bother us, and I'll speculate how much it does bother us, depends on whether what we disagree about is something that is super important to you, one, and two, uh, the extent to which I can show that I've got things right in terms that reasonable people can accept. The disagreements we should be most cautious about the ones where the moral stakes are highest when we're thinking about paternalism are precisely those where the paternalized subject's core beliefs are at stake and we cannot offer shared or shareable reasons for our side of things. To act in these cases poses the real risk of threatening the paternalized subject's sense of self for reasons that she cannot reasonably be expected to understand. And this is when paternalism is most morally problematic. It becomes less problematic as issues of identity and demonstrability are removed from the disagreement. There's still disagreement, but the stakes are much lower. So um, I'm just going to quote myself. I don't know if I actually said it. It's in the paper. I said at the start of the paper, I'm trying to figure out whether the weak versus strong distinction really survives my way of thinking about it. Um, I'm now convinced that uh, I'm abandoning the distinction. Um, if you like how it's, it's all it's like I didn't know before I got here, bringing you along for my journey. Um, nonetheless, the standard way of looking at things pointed us to normatively significant disagreements when it comes to thinking about paternalism. Moreover, it pointed us to distinctions that are closely allied to my way of seeing things. So in other words, I think my way of carving up the territory captures the spirit of the initial weak-strong distinction, um, even if it ultimately <laughs> abandons it. Um, 